this is a joint venture between Disability Rights and Centers for Independent Living statewide to meet our, and talk to our congressional candidates for each district. So this is for the congressional seat in District 2. And uh, we hope to really talk about issues affecting people with disabilities and that we questions we ask will come from our experience working with those with disabilities. And first, uh, we'll start by introducing the candidates and letting them tell a little bit about themselves and what party they represent. So we'll start over here. I'm uh, Bill Benfer. I'm uh, independent, unaffiliated with any party. Uh, I'm fr originally born in Vineland, New Jersey, raised in Millville, New Jersey. Uh, I lived in California for about, uh, in San Diego for about 11 years. Um, when I came back, I, I was married and, and had two children and saw that things were going south. So I decided to run. I, I, my whole campaign is based on trying to bring uh, the 36 defunct and dormant uh, manufacturing facilities back to up and running uh, with green energy technologies. Um, that's my major platform. But I'm also for uh, single payer uh, health care, um, universal health care, and trying to get money out of politics. All right. So now let's go. We're close. <laughs> well, it's good. You spread the message out. <laughs> That's an important message to get out, that it people is. are worthy of, of health care as a human right. In fact, this is my, my shirt that I wear when I give talks for my physician's organization, Physicians for a National Health Program. My name is Steve Fenichel. Um, I grew up in Vineland, and I am basically... Uh, a human rights activist and an environmental activist. I think the most pressing issue, which will not receive much attention from the two corporate party candidates, is the urgent need to overturn Citizens United. With Citizens United, corporations are considered as living people, and they are allowed to contribute as much money as they want. And as long as Citizen United basically has monies from the health insurance companies, the pharmaceutical companies, hospitals for profit, and the AMA, my number one passion can never be realized, and that is healthcare as a human right. Plain and simple. And again, there's other things as well that can never be realized in the public interest as long as that big money has lobbyists from the military industrial complex getting $780 billion in the last military budget. And the most pressing problem, as is, is Bill uh, discussed briefly, is that the International uh, Panel of the Climate Center of the United Nations just came out that this is the last curtain call to reverse the threat of increasing the Earth's temperature, which for 160 years only increased one degree Celsius. Recently, in a decade or so, it increased an additional half a degree centigrade. But it is clearly now felt by all significant climate scientists that get published in peer-reviewed literature that if it gets on the present trajectory unabated, it'll be two degrees centigrade increasing temperature and the climate catastrophe will be unstoppable. I am very optimistic that we will be able to do something to stop this. There'll still be problems if we stay one and a half degrees higher than we should be as we are now, but it will not bring on the cascade of, of uncontrollable climate catastrophe. And that's all I'll say about that. All right, and we'll go to John. Oh, great. I'm John Ardelli. I do have a party affiliation. I'm the Libertarian Party candidate. I'm running on the ballot with Murray Sabrin, who's running for Senate. He couldn't be here today. He's got a pretty busy schedule himself. 
But for those of you who don't know what the Libertarian Party is, it's based on peace, prosperity, freedom, and liberty, and returning our country to the Constitution and the federal government to the four pillars that Thomas Jefferson set up to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare. Promoting the general welfare is something I think we all agree on. While I may have some differences with Bill and Dr. Stephen, I really know we have so much in common that we can work on. And I'll, I'll say one thing, I would support them if your vote goes to them and they serve in Washington, I would support them and I'll stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Because it's worth it to come out to speak with every individual person. That's something that a couple other candidates didn't really unfortunately feel that was important. And that's something that really bugs me. Because everybody is important and we should all have the freedom of choice to be able to choose what is best for us because it's different for you, and for you, and for you, you, each one of us, it's different. We all need to have, be empowered and have the ability to choose whether it's our health care, whether it's our job, whether it's what we say is best for us. We should be able to choose. And I give a lot of credit to Bill and Dr. Stephen for being here because it is that important, and each one of the items that they spoke about is important. I agree with them with Citizens United. I think that's really turned election season into the caustic, polarized, I hate you debate. I mean, if you look at the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, if you have them in the same family, you're going to have a heck of a lousy Thanksgiving, I think. <laughs> so, but trust me, it's the open thoughts and the passion that comes from the third party and independent candidates that will solve the problem, the problems in this country right now. So, uh, thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. And uh, I'm going to start with our first question, and uh, we'll just talk kind of like we are. Um, so the Americans with Disabilities Act is the most comprehensive piece of legislation regarding disability rights passed in 1990. And uh, in Congress last term, it was there was a debate on whether that, uh, that act should be more limited to reduce what they say is drive-by lawsuits by uh, putting the burden more on disabled people to articulate uh, what their rights, what specific rights are being violated. And I just want to go around and see what are your thoughts on the ADA and also what are your thoughts on this act specifically. So I'll start with Mike. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I have lived in several different cities. And living in cities has given me a unique perspective on how accessible things are. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, yes, well, but that's all right. It's okay. There's a, there should be no limitation on the act. It shouldn't be up to disabled people to try to fight for their own civil liberties and rights. Uh, and we actually have to fight to try to make things more accessible and to try to give people with disabilities a better lot in life, especially in cities. I work, used to work in New York City, and I was having trouble walking around. I mean, I always thought, okay, so if I jump on the subway right here, uh, I could probably make it there on time. But how does a person with disabilities get down into the subway? I always thought, like, how, how are they gonna get down? If you're in a wheelchair, how do you get down there? Because there are all these steps, there's like 100 steps to get down into the subway section. It was the same way in California. Uh, I've lived in Colorado a little bit, uh, Texas a little bit. It's the same way all over the country. And we have to give more of a perspective, uh, walk a little bit in disability people's shoes, so to say, uh, and think that way. If somebody has a disability, how are they gonna get through this door? If they have a wheelchair, how are they gonna get to this uh, 
facility or into this room. And to limit something like that act it, it is not right. And I really do feel like we're seeing the greed of capitalism show its ugly face again here. You know, uh, we don't want to pay for this. You guys should pay for this because you're the ones that use it. Well, that's not the way it should be in a free and democratic republic to me. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's go to the doctor. Yeah, I just want to say I am so grateful to the questionnaire that you provided for candidates because it just was like the most educational, mind-expanding experience I ever had in filling it out. So I, I decided to go online and look up ADA Education and Reform Act, H.R. 620. And that's the one that has the great sounding words to it. Kind of like uh, one of our wars was called Operation Enduring Freedom or something. You know, I mean, meaningless language because what I read shocked me. I've been made aware of the problems where it bars you as disabled people from immediately going to court to enforce rights and press for timely removal of whatever barrier might be preventing you from progressing. And it's an outrage. This is really the kind of, it's a con job of language, I think. And I, I feel that, you know, if you're going to change to a new and improved thing, you don't take back the Americans with Disability Act and make it regressive and punitive. And that's all I can say. John. Well, for me, Thomas Jefferson said about rightful liberty, he said, we all have the freedom to do what we want up until the point that it infringes on somebody else's liberties and freedoms. We're all entitled to freedom, freedom to move around and freedom to go from place to place. And it may be more difficult for some people than others and in all different ways. Things I take for granted, you guys just excel at and vice versa. We, we have to with the ADA, always remain diligent in making sure people have that ability to go from place to place. I mean, you wanna, you know, let's see, I'm tall. I don't need this wide of a door. I'm fine with a door this wide. So I go to Washington, I say, oh, doors only have to be two and a half feet wide. That's not what Washington should be doing. They should be making it clear and precise that the things they get involved in, that promoting the general welfare as you have it, would be accessible to everybody. Nobody should be cheated out of that. If you have a business and you open up a doctor's office you may have to replace a door. You don't need a government law for that. If you want your clientele, you adapt. That's not unreasonable to ask. I really think that you know, any attempt to, get, to weaken the ADA is really unfortunate. And I know, I, I think each one of us would stand against any really drastic things and, and work to make it better. Saying I'll change it doesn't mean I'm going to make it worse. It means I want to make it better, and it would be communication like that. And again, I point to the two major party candidates who aren't here who may not be that interested and may just be talk. But if I'm in Congress in January, I will work with all different groups, a variety of groups, to see what's best, not what's needed, if you know what I mean. Yes, thank you guys. My second question is, um, as you know, Medicaid and Medicare are essential to those with disabilities. They provide, many in our community uh, need healthcare um, because 
of pressures in Washington and realities of the deficit. Often these uh, these um these programs are threatened with cuts, and I would like to know what you would do to really protect these programs in a way of making them more fiscally sustainable and to ensure that people with disabilities still have access to these programs, even as we face uh, realities of financial need. So, I'll start with you. Well, I, they call them entitlement programs, but they're not entitlements. Everybody pays into them. You know, you're not, in, I don't, I feel like, like Dr. Penichel was saying earlier. Oh, Steve. It's uh, Steve, Steve, Dr. Steve. 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 <laughs> you're just Steve. Okay. <laughs> Like he was saying earlier, um, you know, they put these fancy labels on things, and sometimes they put them on to try to make them bright and shiny, and sometimes they put them on to try to discredit them. And saying that something like uh, Medicare, Medicaid, things like that are, are uh, entitlement programs, it's not really, it's doing them a disservice. We have, to, we have to keep these programs in place. I mean, we're paying into them. I mean, generational, we've been paying into them, and for good reason, because people need them. And if we start to move into a direction where we have to pay uh, some kind of corporate group out of pocket, you know, there's going to be huge amounts of Americans, especially people with disabilities, who aren't going to get the kind of care that they are required to get. And I will do anything if I'm elected. Uh, I will support any bill that sees that Medicare and Medicaid is protected, and I will go against hard nose against any bill that tries to destroy them. Steve. Yeah, basically short and sweet. To me, it's as simple as health care is a human right. Plain and simple. And basically, there should not be Medicaid because it's stigmatized. I was the only physician in this area who would see people on Medicaid in my private office. None of the others did. And now I'm working at Complete Care at Cape May Courthouse, uh, and basically it's a federal clinic providing care for those with no insurance and those on Medicaid. And let me tell you, it's a very stigmatized health care. I mean, they pleaded, in a sense, with me to be the safety net for them, and I went there and, um, I'm, I'm board certified in family medicine and dermatology, and I really am practicing dermatology for them. And I have seen five people less than 50 <coughs> years old that had widespread melanoma metastases. And the first one only of the five I asked, why did you wait so long? And they said, because I didn't want to risk losing our family home or personal bankruptcy as medical expenses are the largest cause of personal bankruptcy. So I really feel that, you know, making this an issue of anything less, and we have to look at what resources we have, and I know for one thing, $780 billion to a defense budget, uh, and all of the expenses from our climate change, look at Florence, look at whatever hurricane, is that me? Michael. No, I'm sorry. Michael. Yeah, you know, I mean, the money being wasted on things that should be going to providing a health care with dignity for all Americans, and it should be one level of care for everyone. Here's your card. The big poo-poos don't get anything better than the little poo-poos. And that basically is the Canadian model. I did my internship in Toronto, uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. And it was such an eye-opener. My first day at work at Mount Sinai, I was called into the medical director's office, and she said, Steve, here's your OHIP card, and here's one for your wife. And I said, that's great. What does it stand for? Ontario Health Insurance Program. I said, what does it mean? What does it do for me? And it was like this incredible drum roll that has stayed with me and propels me in what I'm doing now. You need any doctor anywhere in Canada. You need any prescription anywhere in Canada. You need hospitalization anywhere in Canada. Yada, 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 yada. Just show your card and it's covered. The problem with the Canadian system is it's underfunded. They only fund it to 10% of their gross domestic product. We in America spend 18% of our health care in public dollars. What do they get? What do we get? 
if the Canadians could up it to 12 or 13 percent, there wouldn't be the waits. They call it in America rationing of care. Well, when I had my cataract done, I had to wait six months to get my right eye and another eight months to get my left eye. But we don't call it rationing of care, it's wait time. But you know, elective procedures, unless you have an overabundance of people ready to give a service, will have to be. But any emergent situation with Medicare for All model in Canada, you're immediately seen. And if there's any problem with an elective procedure that puts you too far out, all the wait times for every hospital in Canada is on the internet. And you can see which hospital within your reach would have a lesser wait time if you're really anxious to get a hip replacement that much sooner or whatever. So, you know, we have to fight for Medicare for all. And I don't think then these issues would be uh, surviving. They're non-issues made by an artificial health care, dysfunctional health care system, I think. John? Well, I, I think Steve hit it right at the end there. Uh, I think, personally, that we have a dysfunctional micromanaging government that gets involved in a lot of things, especially in New Jersey. And because ever, for every dollar New Jersey sends to Washington, we get back 77 cents. So automatically, a lot of our costs are higher. This, the way things are, it would be much better to be handled, not at a national level, but a state level. Now, the Libertarian Party, Murray Saber and myself, have a tax plan that would be dollar for dollar tax credit for charitable donations. So donate out, you get a tax credit. If I owe $4,000 and I make a $4,000 check, there's $4,000 to a charitable uh, entity. There it is. And hopefully it would go to charitable entities that provide you know, medical coverage. Because right now the federal government has let everybody down. They take their cut and then give out the rest to everybody else. That's what has to be stopped. And I know that's why they're running. That's one of the reasons why I'm running, not just in healthcare, but the federal government is just too overbearing in a lot of things. If we turn it over to the states and give that money back to the states, they would better be able to handle some of the problems because right now the federal government would have to handle everybody equally. Fair enough, but $100 in Montana or Missouri or Nebraska is a lot different than $100 here in New Jersey. And that's where we really lose out, all of us. So by getting it out of the government's hands, turning it over to the states and empowering them to work with other states is what I feel is the cure, and the libertarian view is the cure to out of control Medicare and Medicaid deficits and the wait times and everything else that we're talking about here. Okay, um, my next question is, housing is a very uh, important issue to those with disabilities and finding a hard affordable housing can be very difficult. So what are your solutions to providing more affordable housing to people with disabilities and people in general? Well, I feel like we have to first, you know, get rid of this market mentality, uh, this profitability, um, the what's the ROI. We have to stop thinking in a way that makes people look at real estate as an investment for individuals. And we have to start getting state involvement into building facilities for people with disabilities and with special needs. And our government's view with um, people with mental illness, the elderly, uh, people with disabilities, uh, you know, it's, it's a view that they're not really helping our capital. So we're just gonna move them over here and not worry about that right now. And that has to end. That has to end. I, uh, I differ a little bit um, with the view that federal government, I, I, I agree that federal government is not doing what they should be doing to help. But I feel like it has to be regulated somehow. These kind of things have to be regulated in a way that we can put in check this capital greed, this way of trying to bring in as much money as we can 
at the expense of people with disabilities, at the expense of people with mental illnesses. Uh, we have to focus more on trying to get them help. And part of that help is housing. So we have to put more funds into it. We have to get back into the understanding that there are people with special needs. There are people with disabilities. There are people that need housing. And if you don't do it with the government, who's gonna pay for it? There's only so many philanthropic people out there. There's only so much money that the state has. And unfortunately, right now in our government, we have this idea that if you can run a good business, you can run a good government, which I feel like the only pathway that leads to is fascism. Yes. Because when you think about businesses, right? Uh, I worked for a Fortune 500 commercial real estate company in San Diego. And the CEO, whatever he said, that was it. Okay, so that's one person. And then it went out like a pyramid. And I was a low man. I had no say. I saw everything that was wrong with what our company was doing. But I had no say. In it. And as soon as you questioned it, then you, you're fired. You're let go. And that, if you run a country or a government like that, or a state, you know, or even a district, the, the only thing you're going to get out of that is tyranny. You know, and to quote... Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson papers he talks about tyranny mm -hmm. you know and he talks more broadly about uh, full democracy leading to tyranny but to me I feel like if we don't regulate this if we don't demand it then the capitalist greed of people will just lead them to say hey look you want to live in this facility here you know we're getting money from the government but what's the facility like do they have clean water? Do they have maintenance that's taking place? Do they have the things that the people need? Do they have accessible entry ways? You know, and if you can't get that, you have to demand it. I'm all for free, demo free democracy and free capital, but I am also against the idea that things can't be regulated. They have to be regulated. In a capitalist society, you have to regulate certain things, and this is a prime example. You have to have regulatory statutes in place because people aren't going to do it right now unless they see a profit. They're just not going to do it. Is the return ROI is return on investment? Is the ROI worth it? You know, and us as a district right now, since I'm going down this avenue, <laughs> mm. uh, we as a district right now, we are not a profitable district. <coughs> we haven't been for 20 years. You know, Lo Biondo took us to a place where we are not a good, we're not gonna give the state a good return on its investment. And how do we get away from that? You know, how do we start creating our own revenue so we don't have to depend on the state? Well, it's, it's a huge problem. That's why I wanna bring jobs to the area because if you bring jobs to the area, you start to make yourself liquid, you start to bring in your own revenue, and then you don't have to worry about the state. You don't have to worry about the CEO. In Trenton you can do it yourselves and I think district 2 could do things like this ourselves I think we could be a staple an example for other districts and other states in our in our country we have to start taking care of people and if people don't want to do it well now you have to now you're regulated to do it and some regulation in my mind is bad it only leads to disruption it only leads to a manipulative uh, form of control but this kind of regulation is good because if you have housing codes in place if you have rules and regulations in place of what can be allowed how clean does it have to be how, how much maintenance does it have to have then the people have good affordable clean good places to live now, I feel like that's one way to make sure that we get those kind of uh, affordable living conditions for people with dis disabilities, people with mental illnesses, and, and it, the elderly has to be included in this as well, because they're thrown aside as well. It's not, we don't take care of these people because in a capitalist system, they're no longer viable. They're not part of the cycle as much anymore, and that's not fair. We have to think outside of that. There you go. Steve. <laughs> Sorry. So, Keeping it simple, you know, 
your questionnaire was just incredible. I mean, specifically, it spelled out that in New Jersey, there are 27,265 units that are needed in the state of New Jersey. And that New Jersey is the ninth highest in our nation. What do we do about this? Well, I think for one thing, there has to be a moratorium on home foreclosures. And I live in Ocean City, and my wife and I, every time we go for a walk, we, we think we got Alzheimer's. Do you remember the house that used to be here? I mean, gone like that, and then it's an investment. Two unit, four unit condo. And they're really, really shirking their responsibility in the community of Ocean City for providing affordable housing. And that's something that I've brought up many times at the city council meeting really is not right. I also think that there have to be enactment of laws that will eliminate housing discrimination. I mean, you know, landlords cannot be allowed to discriminate if someone with a disability were seeking a place to live. In fact, there should be some analysis and study as to whether there would be some extra points for a prospective tenant with a disability, exactly. actually, because those without disabilities can mo motor vote all around looking for a place. But those with disabilities, I think, really should have some extra points up in having a legal right and claim preventing them from denial of, of accommodation. And there needs to be a fostering of policies that uh, allow for excessive, inclusive communities, as well as, well, that's all I'll say about this. I mean, it was a great question because I didn't realize the extent of the problem, and there are solutions. John? Well, if you're talking about price in particular, it is a lot more expensive for anybody to go rent as opposed to, uh, to as opposed to buying. Uh, my mortgage payment is probably about the same, if not less, than what it would be to rent an apartment or a condo. If you look at the causes for some of those, and uh, and I'm talking everybody. Okay, let's talk everybody because we're all in the same boat. The regulations, and I know what Bill's saying about common sense regulations. Yes, <laughs> if I pay for a house or a rental, I want to make sure it's built to code and doesn't fall down. And that thing, that's, that's fine. But you have so many layers upon layers of regulations that make it very expensive to acquire land, to prepare land. You can have land that's limited use. You could have zoning that's bad. All these need to be worked out. That type of thing. Plus you have the infrastructure of the city. So if you have a city or a town that's been mismanaged for whatever reason, Atlantic City's probably the best example. It's been mismanaged and overspent for decades. They got high off all the money from casinos, but then when that dried up, now they're stuck with uh, union contracts and expenses that just fall back on everybody and make it expensive for all of us. And these are the things that need to be addressed. Do I have answers to that? Sure I do. And some people probably won't want to hear them. But these types of hard choices and hard decisions have to be made. We can't keep kicking the can down the road because the cost of everything involved of having of having a, a, you know, so let's say any type of complex or rental uh, unit from electricity to water to you know, every part of it is more expensive than it needs to be because of other things that are wrong with government and not necessarily because they're trying to keep certain people out. But uh, as far as the price goes, 
I think we've got a lot of work to do at the municipal and county levels, and um, maybe that's where we need to be running next year. <laughs> Thank you. So my next question is regard to unemployment for people with disabilities it is about twice as much as for people without disabilities. And my question is, what steps do you think uh, the government can take to close that gap? I think that uh, it goes right in line with what I was speaking about before, where uh, if you're not part of the, the cycle of capitalism, uh, you're kind of pushed to the side. And it's unfortunate. And I've seen, coming from California, especially in Southern California, where it's much more progressive area, I have seen businesses take the initiative to make sure that they hire uh, people with disabilities. And they make it a practice. And they pay them just as they would any other employee. They give them responsibilities. They, they, you know, there's a, a restaurant in San Diego where the manager 